Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to give you a, a presentation now of the work that I submitted for my MSc, but what I would like to say right up front is this is not a work that I did on my own, and in fact, Suuma has work, walked part of the journey with me too. And I'll explain in the next slide how this came about and how Suuma has actually been involved right from the beginning of this. So the, the study was really a retrospective review of a range of internationally located recompression chambers, um, primarily treating or focusing their, their treatments on injured recreational uh, scuba divers. Um, and we, the tool that was used was the risk assessment guide, I'll talk about that in a moment, but it exists in a published form published internationally, um, over a period of 13 years. So I accumulated 105 risk assessments um, over that period of time out in the field. I'll show you the, geograph the geographic layout in a moment, and you can see it is a very wide spectrum of chambers around the globe. When we have a diving injury, there's always going to be a, a medical practitioner that has to make, up, make a decision either where to refer that injured diver to in terms of a facility where they might not themselves have been acquainted with what is available, so it's a remote referral, pretty much on a blind basis hoping that the patient is going to get an effective treatment, or the physician operates the facility and ultimately then takes responsibility for the outcome of the patient. And the task really came to light in 1997, more or less, when France and I established the first commercial clinical hyperbaric facility in South Africa and the, I remember getting the call from France, I was down in Cape Town, saying, listen, scratching his head, the hospital safety board has told us we need to tell them that what we're doing isn't going to affect the safety record and South Africa has a fairly well established and proud safety record in terms of our occupational safety and the hospitals are very clearly focused on this. Now, had I been in, in the States or in Europe, I could possibly have reached across the shelf and picked up a book that says this is how you now, what you need to comply to. But in South Africa at the time, we didn't have any handy publications that we could get our hands on. So we went back to the drawing board and essentially decided on a risk assessment approach. So instead of complying blindly to somebody else's publication, we analyzed the real risks that each of these facilities might have and made sure that we complied or mitigated or controlled that risk. And um, I've got given you a range of the publications that don't present particularly well, but just to give you a kind of feeling for what we were faced with and what we had at our disposal at the time, for those of you involved in commercial diving, we have the um, classification society rules that dictate how you design a diving system that is to be built into a ship. And the, the focus on that is whatever they're doing, they don't want to jeopardize the safety of the ship. So the equipment has to comply with electrical and equipment regulations to make sure that the ship and therefore the insurance value of the ship is not affected. So that was one of the books, one of the, the resources we had at the time. Then we obviously went to the United States Navy who have got a very well catalogued and very well uh, developed um, manual called the US Navy Diving Manual that has, has assimilated a lot of history and given us treatments that we can give as well as dictated to some extent the type of equipment that's available. The problem with this is this is focused primarily on military divers and most of the time we are dealing with recreational divers that are not trained and super fit military personnel. Then we have um, publications called the um, UHMS Guidelines for Monoplace and Multiplace Chambers written pretty much on a consensus basis but chapters put together under the UHMS giving operating facilities in the states some guidelines that they can follow, follow for their clinical facilities. Um, clearly written around US laws, US practices and a lot of the information was either outdated or didn't really apply to what we do in South Africa. This is here about as close to the Bible as you can get in terms of hyperbaric safety. A very well known, very well um, referred to publication called the NFPA 99 standard and it is actually now a standard. Um, the word NFPA means National Fire Prevention Association, so their whole focus is on fire. And this has been the problem we have always been faced with in hyperbaric medicine, is each of these publications is focused on a specific aspect of safety. None of them have taken us systematically through our facility and given us the wisdom and the understanding as to why we need to do certain things to ensure the safety. And then finally we have a range of pressure vessel codes that tell us how to design the pressure vessels. But this particular code here, you'll see it has a very good name, um, Safety Standard for Pressure Vessels for Human Occupancy, and most of you might think that's the book I'm looking for. But the, the genesis of this particular book was that in around about the 1960s, early 1970s, when the first hyperbaric chambers were coming on stream in terms of numbers, they realized that we need to have visual contact with our patients, and therefore we need to have some form of 
glass or a perspex thing to see through. And the pressure vessel codes that exist do not allow you to manufacture a pressure vessel out of any material except metal. So this code was specifically written to allow us to design in acrylics, um, obviously for the windows of the chamber. So its focus was primarily in the beginning on acrylic windows. Later on they extended that, but as always happens, you have a primary focus and everything else becomes an add-on and a patch-on, and your total document does not give you all the information that you require to put together a uh, safe facility. So what we did is we took the information in all of these books, we assessed the risks that we had at the facility, and then we set about checking that we'd cover those risks. And then we applied a final test, and in about 1997-98, a publication came out of the States called a 73-year analysis of chamber fires. And we went through every single one of those fires to make sure that what we were going to do could not replicate that accident where they had fires around the world. So a pretty thorough process to make sure that the Eugene Marais facility would comply not only with typical international standards, but actually addressed all the risks that we were likely to face. And we compiled this into a risk assessment guide that has various combinations. Um, here's the book in its current form, um, used pretty much internationally. And in about 1998, you can correct me now, Franz Suhuma, um, realizing that we now are starting to see more facilities come on stream, where people were talking about establishing hyperbreak facilities, asked me if I would please put together a document for Suhuma that would empower the physicians to be able to take on the operational um, safety and responsibility of these facilities. And that was pretty much the genesis of the risk assessment process. What it really means though is that we go out into the field and, and this was launched pretty much after about 1999 by International Dam when they asked us if we could please give the referring physicians some idea as to the safety status of these um, remote, when I say remote, I mean facilities located in relatively remote parts of the globe where people tend to congregate to dive because the diving is good, but the infrastructure and the development and the regulatory structure of those remote areas in most cases was undefined. So islands in the Caribbean, um, places in the Red Sea, many facilities or many diving locations in Thailand and the Philippines, and you can hear already from the countries I'm describing areas that are pretty much unregulated when it comes to occupational safety. But it gave us really a systematic approach to then evaluating and seeing whether these facilities are safe for divers to be treated in when they are referred to them. I can't claim that this is all original in terms of the concept of risk assessment because in the 1990s, uh, starting in Australia, not so much in Europe, Europe came a little bit after this, um, part of the process of uh, getting permission to operate a pressure vessel in parts of Australia was you had to do a risk assessment of not only the design of the chamber but the intended operation of that, of that pressure vessel and convince the Department of Industrial Affairs that that pressure vessel in operation couldn't explode under normal operating conditions. And we took really the same approach to make sure that when we operate a hyperbaric chamber we're looking at not only the technical aspects but the operational aspects of it too to make sure we don't end up with an accident. Just briefly, we've spoken a little bit about safety. Yatsek has mentioned aspects of this too. What is unique in a chamber operation is that we have obviously exposure to hyperbaric pressure, so we have greater than normal pressure. We have very, um, very clear fire and explosion risks, and history has shown us that this has been the biggest cause of death and destruction in hyperbaric chambers, including, for those of you that might not have been here previous Zoom meetings where we discussed our very own homegrown accident we had in South Africa in. No, I know Ipala but it was 2000, no, 1998, 99. I don't remember exactly what the year was. Again, fire and explosion was, was, was the end result. Not the cause, but the end result. Then we have, if you think about a hyperbaric chamber as a physician, the patient goes into the chamber, the door is closed, the chamber is then pressurized, and now you lose your ability to all of a sudden change your mind. You can't simply open the door and take the patient out. So the patient goes into some form of distress, you're stuck with the patient under pressure and you have, in the best case, between four and six minutes in a multi-place chamber to get the patient out again before you can apply um, whatever you need to do to the patient. But if something goes wrong, you again, you cannot simply unwind the clock and get access to the patient. In a monoplace chamber, and in South Africa we have mostly monoplace chambers, only one sees the operational multiplace chamber in terms of the accredited facilities. The monoplace chamber typically between 60 seconds and 90 seconds before you can get the patient out. Now that's enough time in terms of a patient that has breathed enough oxygen, but not enough time if there's a fire or something else that's gone wrong.
we also have that's not only restrictive in terms of access but also visual access in a multi-place chamber you don't always see everything that's going on inside the chamber so we have what we call restrictive nature facilities then we have a range of mechanical and physiological or health issues and I'll give you a few examples of those in picture form and then clearly we're operating potentially dangerous machinery we have compressors we have electrical equipment we have gas cylinders we have a whole range of typically mechanical issues and what is unique about a hyperbaric facility is that these don't occur in isolation, they actually occur in combination. So we have a more potentially hazardous situation than in many of the other aspects of what we're doing in medicine. Okay, when we talk about risk assessment, and people use the word glibly, risk assessment, looking at risks, but let's have a look at the word risk for a moment. And a risk is, it's a state of uncertainty, it's not an absolute fact. But a risk is a combination of the likelihood or probability that some exposure to a hazard will lead to negative consequences. Now it might be written in a form that you might think is fairly clumsy, but it actually allows us to address very specific issues so that we can cope with that risk. The hazard is the theory. So what is potentially dangerous in a situation? So we can really do a hazard analysis and come up with a long list of things that could potentially go wrong. But that would be impossible for us to do almost anything. You couldn't get in your motor car and drive onto the road because there are hazards on the road too. What we really try to do is we try to look at the how likely is something to happen, are we going to have an exposure to that hazard, and what are the typical consequences, and that helps us then define our attention and our prioritization of what those risks are. And we do this in terms of traditionally, not this is not something that we've derived here, but traditionally through a risk score, and the magnitude of the score is the product of the probability times exposure times the, the consequence. And we'll look at that in a moment when I talk about the, the methodology we used. And we know clearly that a risk results from an exposure to a hazard. And just to cut right to the chase, as somebody else quoted earlier today in the terminology, we are looking to prevent injuries to patients and to staff members, and maybe to a lesser extent to damaged equipment. And that's really what we're trying to focus our attention on. And to go back to the first opening statements I made, we're looking to try to protect the physician that has to take responsibility for this but might not have all the necessary technical training that they have some means of getting a feeling for whether their facility, their operation is safe or isn't safe. Okay, so armed with all of this with a risk assessment hat and with a, with a, 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 a consistent approach to this, um, I then did a whole range of, uh, of site visits and risk assessments by invitation. So none of this, Gregory, to go back to what you were saying earlier about voluntary, these were all voluntary assessments. The facilities put their hands up and said to Dan, please, we would very much like you to send your assessor out and tell us how safe is our facility. And about 90% of the time, I was talking directly to the physicians that res res were responsible for those facilities. So they wanted me to convince them that the operation they were running was safe. From the Divers Alert Network, we wanted to know how safe these facilities were in these remote um, locations. I followed the risk assessment guide, so a very consistent way of evaluating each of these facilities. And instead of going there with a white coat and a clipboard and ticking off boxes, I didn't do any of that. I simply focused on the actual risks that each of those facilities had, so I wasn't checking that they ticked all the boxes. I looked at how they ran the, the, the operation using the risk assessment guide and explained to them why these issues were issues they needed to focus on. So it became very much a discussion and not an inspection, but what we call an assessment. But all the information I gathered was done very consistently so that I was building up a database of information that was really comparable with each of the facilities that I was visiting. Each of the facilities then got a report which varied between about 55 and 80 pages. And I, in, up until the end of this review, I'd done 105 facilities. So think of 105 multiplied by typically 60 pages. You know, that's a lot of work that goes into producing, producing the data. And then not just telling people that they had risks, but providing realistic recommendations as to how they could address those risks. It's all very well telling a person that they're doing something that's not safe. But what you need to do is show them how they can then remedy that. And even before I started with, with, with a master's writer for this, we could see as Divers Alert Network the impact this had on the facilities. They became empowered, they understood the process, the physicians felt better, and the facilities themselves felt better about what they were doing. Okay, just to give you a couple of, of uh, visual pictures here, what you might see out there in terms of remote facilities. So we have a chamber. That's, that's very, very typical of a deck decompression chamber that's been a little bit made a bit more comfortable for injured people to be treated on, and the patient's going to be in there for between 90 minutes if they're lucky to four and a half hours. 
But have a look at where the door sits and where the mattress is. So you can imagine when you have an accident or some incident and you do get inside the chamber and the patients are really lying down blocking the doorway. So they have no concept, many of the people have no concept of the risks they're facing with until you can explain to them how are you going to get the door open in an emergency when the patient is no longer co cooperating with you. Two very scary pictures and they don't really present very well here, but those are windows of chambers. Okay, you can say to me, you clearly see the visual damage and you can be convinced that obviously these are not safe to be used. But let me tell you right now that both of these chambers, and there's a date stamp over there on this one, this is from fairly recently, but that was 2004. And both of these chambers are still running with those windows as they are at the moment. Clearly, the windows are in distress, clearly there's an accident waiting to happen, but sometimes the people just don't actually take on the responsibility of understanding what they're dealing with. If you can imagine, even at a very low pressure, what the impact will be if one of these windows has to rupture. And then I was toying with the idea of asking you whether you could see what the right and the wrong was, but I thought, no, maybe I would uh, be either be seen to be patronizing or you'd think I'm being really silly here. But this is a very sad picture of a facility that rated themselves very highly in terms of safety. This is a safety valve, the main safety valve of the chamber. That is the correct orientation. There's a spring on the inside, the spring pushes down on a plate, and the pressure in the chamber pushes up against the plate, and if the pressure is more than the spring pressure, the safety valve opens. So when these people decided to save some space and screw the outlet of the safety valve onto the chamber, the deeper the chamber goes, the more that safety valve will seal until the chamber itself will blow up. But again, total ignorance, not understanding, and simply doing what they thought was the right thing to do. Those, those are just a few of the examples of things you might see out in an assessment. Okay, so in terms of the aim um, of, of the actual project and what we set out to do is to take these 105 assessment reports and some photographs and notes and things and review the main safety elements, the issues that we were concerned about. Typically things like safety valves, windows, but my focus has always been less on the technical and more on the operational because that's where most of the risks actually exist. So looking at the operating procedures, the training, the preparedness for the understanding of the emergency situations and so on. And then developing a scoring system that one could actually rate those safety concerns and decide which of them are more important, that require more attention, and which ones we often see quoted in the international standards, but actually they are irrelevant in terms of what could physically go wrong. And so we have a lot of attention paid and a lot of money spent, but actually they are not important in the overall safety regimen. Then the second step was to then have a look at things like the geography, the utilization, medical supervision, and see how do these relate to the safety status of the facility. So we know that we measure the safety in terms of non-compliance risks. But how does the geography, the utilization, the training, um, medical supervision, how does that correlate then back to the safety status? And to do that, we needed to determine what we call risk scores and risk assessment scores, and I'll, I'll explain to, the, to you those in a moment. And then finally, how could we come up with a predictive model that when we are referring to a chamber in an area that we don't know and has not been assessed, how do we know what that relative safety status of that chamber is likely to be based on a few non-evocative questions that really are not going to put the backs up of the, of the operating staff there. You're going to simply ask them, what type of chamber do you have? What sort of medical supervision do you have? And from that, you can then predict in a, on a relative scale the safety status of that facility. Here's the map to show you where these facilities are located around the world. And you can see right on the west over here, there's one up in, um, in California and San Francisco, Mexico and the Galapagos Islands. A lot of diving done in the Caribbean, and I'm sorry this point is not very... Uh, very strong. A few down in Brazil, then several around Europe, and you might say, Yatsak, you might ask, now why are these facilities being brought into essentially a remote assessment of facilities? Because primarily they're treating injured divers. And we also wanted to see how, do, how does a theoretically modern, very compliant hyperbaric facility fit into the safety scale when you're looking at the broad spectrum? And some of the information is totally counterintuitive. So some of the biggest offenders sit actually in mainland Europe where they have the strictest regulations. Then obviously down in southern Africa and the east coast of Africa we have a range of facilities in Mauritius and um, Reunion and Zanzibar. And then, did you have a pointer for me, Franz? Please. Just want to really highlight the middle button. Um, you'll see a big gap over here, and that gap is not in was not intentional, but Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific have a lot of really popular diving resorts, Truck Lagoon and um, Vanuatu and Fiji, 
But in everything in life, there's politics. And at that stage, even with the International Dam, they kind of told us we're not welcome to go and do risk assessments there. The beauty of what we found from the study is that we can use our predictive model and actually get a very good idea of what's there. And I've actually been to a few chambers there. I haven't been allowed to assess them. But I can tell you that they fit in typically into the population of chambers around the world. Interestingly, we did about 66, 67% of all the chambers that would be typically dealing with injured scuba divers in relatively remote regions or areas that are focusing on treating recreational divers. So a very good representation of the total population. So our data was actually very, very, um, uh, uh, I wouldn't say mature, but it, very representative of what is going out there. So we don't have any, too many gaps. So that's the geography. In terms of the methodology of the actual process, um, we collated the data from the, from the report. So we had 105 reports as our, as our baseline to work from. For each of the facilities, we extracted the associated, we call associated factors, it's just a word, it just means things like geography, utilization, staff training, medical supervision, how often, how, what sort of uh, operating hours they keep, are they open for emergencies, are they only open during office hours. A couple of interesting things in here, um, such as the uh, treatment protocols, you often hear when you're moving around in these industries, people talking about the Navy, US Navy Table 6A, we can do deep treatments over here. But very interesting to see how that then relates to safety of those facilities later on. Um, and then once we got those things uh, buttoned down, we took each of the facilities, identified up to 82 potential safety infringements or areas of concern that we had, and simply marked them as a yes or a no. So I had a good count for each facility as to how many non-compliances or risk infringements we had for each of those facilities. And then I populated that on a spreadsheet, took, took out all identification of what those facilities were, locked the data so we could actually play with the data, and when we did the analysis, we didn't know where the chamber was or which chamber it was, so we didn't have a preconceived idea that this particular chamber located in Poland would be a good example of things that should comply, should be safe. Everything was pretty much um, de-identified at that stage. Just a couple of pictures again to show you what we're looking at. You'll see this is very typical um, here of a remote recompression chamber, typical deck decompression chamber. I would say of all the multi-place chambers around the world, probably the most common remote type chamber you get. Not very comfortable, not very pleasant spending four and a half hours inside a chamber like that. And France has been to Zanzibar where that's located. At the stage it was installed, there was no air conditioning. And the outside environment is about 35 degrees. Inside the chamber, 38, 39 degrees, really not ideal for an effective treatment. And then on the other hand, you have a typical, very modern um, German built chamber in a hospital in Europe, um, but with very comparable safety concerns. And then monoplace chambers, for those of you that don't know what they look like, and Gregory and others will recognize these ones over here, um, we also have a home-built South African chamber, monoplace chamber, that works in a facility here and actually provides effective treatments too. So pretty good scope in terms of the different types of chambers. Okay, so here we have about 16,000 bits of information of data and the, the job now was to analyze this data and see what it meant. The first task was to try to provide some form of weighting system that you can, when you're comparing two safety issues, to decide which one is more important, which one is less important. And we did this in a, in a, a, a rating scale, you're looking at the probability um, of an actual exposure. What happens, what's the outcome of an exposure? If you have an accident, how sort of severe is it going to be? Is it going to be a disruption to business or is it going to lead to death and destruction? And then because we're dealing with hyperbaric facilities which are not that easy to compare to a machine operating in a factory or a ladder that people are climbing up, we have a combination of fire issues, health issues and mechanical issues. So we actually stratified each of these risks and looked at them from those three different aspects. So we have a very well thought through scoring system that doesn't just overcompensate for fire, but actually look, takes into account the health issues as well as the mechanical issues. So those, those three there really require the assessor to make some sort of a judgment as to how severe he thinks an incident would be. The frequency of occurrence, so how often do we get the exposure, that came from the data. For every, we have 105 chambers, we can see how many times that infringement occurs and we can get a great frequency rating of 85% or 75% or 10% of, of the times that those infringements occur across the entire population. So one of the actual drivers in determining a weighting system came from the data itself.
The outcome of, it, of the analysis was to then determine what we call a risk score. So for each of those 82 different risks that we were looking at, we could score them relative to each other. And I'll show you what the data looks like in a moment. So we have, for instance, people would typically say to you, the windows are a risk. And they will talk to you at length about how big a risk the windows are. But once you analyze the fire risk, the health risk, the mechanical risk, the frequency of exposure, the probability of it leading to an accident, remember the pictures I showed you earlier of those windows? It actually comes out with a very low score. So the actual risk of the window is relatively low because from the engineering side, and that's about the only time I can stand up here and say I'm the engineer amongst the doctors, the engineers have done a really great job with windows. And we've had very, very, very few accidents involving windows, although people tend to be very fastidious about them and very concerned about scratching them, they are not the weak link in the chamber. So we end up with a risk score for each of those 82 different risks that we've looked at. And then the aha moment came, Jack and I were going through this, looking at the data, was that if we take each of those risk scores and go back to each of those chambers and add up what the total risk score for the chamber was, all of a sudden we have a relative risk assessment score for each of the chambers we're looking at. So now we can compare the chambers with each other and see which chambers are, have a higher score that are less safe and which of the chambers have a lower score and are more safe. And then one can go and look at all those additional factors like staff training and medical supervision and see how those influence the safety status of a facility. Just looking at the risk scores and just a couple of pictures to show you what, what one gets there. We talk typically about windows and safety valves, but these are far more important risks when we're doing the assessments. Um, that's in a modern hospital in Europe, that is what you find when you lift up the floorboards. And it wasn't at Yatsik's chamber, so don't look at Yatsik. But it's a really scary picture. <laughs> that's only because your chamber doesn't have floorboards. <laughs> You can think of the human waste and everything that's lying down there, and they, they tell me very proudly that once a year they lift up the floorboards and clean out the, the bilges. That's really not, not very well done. That's what it looks like if you pay no attention to it, so after several years that will lead to that, very serious rust and corrosion. And then a picture that again doesn't present very clearly, looks great on the screen here. That is a very good illustration of things that people are completely unaware of, and the risk that we're looking at here is leakage in pipes or the way that I assessed it is how often does that facility do a leak test of their pipe work? And you think, well, what's a leak on a pipe going to do? How is it an impact on the safety? Well, it actually affects fire because if there's oxygen in that pipe and you're leaking oxygen and you get a spark somewhere, and I assure you in the control panel there's lots of dust, you can have a fire. You can leak gas without knowing it, and by the time you come to switch over your gas on the chamber to give the patient the other gas, there's no gas, gas left in the system. Or if you have a leak, a leak is normally a telltale that you're leading to a mechanical failure. If you don't address that leak, you end up with what we've seen happen in some facilities. They'll end up with a pipe break or a pipe burst. Not only will they lose the gas, terminate the treatment and jeopardize the patients in the treatment, but have a mechanical piece of equipment flying around in the room. And those sort of accidents have happened mostly in hospitals and big facilities that have a lot of pipe work. We don't see them very typically in the smaller remote chambers. When you tabulate the risks, and I've just, for the, for, for the sake of picking up a few examples, giving you the top 10 risks that we've found at the facilities. If you have a look at the one that comes up at the very top, safety drills not being practiced at chambers, and you'd think most of you, I'm sure, but this is a no-brainer. You should clearly practice your safety drills at the facility. And yet at 89 out of 105 chambers, the staff get trained initially in safety drills, and then with time people forget about it. And three or four or five years later, the last time they practiced the safety drills was when the chamber was actually installed. A very, very scary and sobering picture. And you can see the type of data we get out of here. It gives you an 85% occurrence. So our frequency of exposure to that hazard is actually 85%. That's a very high factor. And then when we work out the actual risk score, it comes out at a value of 33, which indicates to us on the scale, obviously, between 0 and 33, that is the risk that we are most concerned about. Very apparent when one looks at these infringements over here that most of them are based on operation of the facility and maintenance and very few of them relate back to purely technical issues. Okay, so we have now a risk, a risk score for each of the risks and we can sum up those risk scores and get a, a, a rating for each of the facilities themselves. And now we can look at that facility and decide, for instance, geographically, how important is geography on the ultimate safety outcome. And I like to start with that particular one because we were looking at chambers in Switzerland and Germany and Poland, and we were looking at chambers in Jamaica, um, 
trying to think of a good example where you'd expect to get a really bad chamber, but maybe Indonesia, one of those countries. And intuitively you're going to think, no regulations, no regulation on staff, no regulation on medical supervision, we should have a pretty grim picture. If I go to Switzerland or Germany or Poland, and I'm only picking on Poland because Jacek is here, you'd expect to see a super facility without a single infringement. And that's not how it actually turned out. And, you know, Jack wouldn't allow me to make any conclusions until I got right to the end of the, of the, of the assessment. I had to look at the data and analyze the data and not jump to any conclusions. But counter to our intuition, is that many of these remote facilities in a bigger place like Egypt or, or Thailand are actually dealing with very wealthy, relatively speaking for the country, a wealthy market of divers that are prepared to pay a lot of money to dive and therefore there's a great push on those facilities to provide modern, up-to-date treatment so that people visiting the Maldives know that if they do get bent they're going to get a good treatment. So a lot of pressure on those facilities to actually make sure that they're safe. And then we find a facility in a European country that is located in a hospital but down in the basement and only ever used to treat recreational divers that are injured on the nearby lake, completely neglected, the doctor doesn't even know where the chamber is, the staff are trained five years before, they don't practice their, their stuff, a lot of no maintenance is done and you find they come out with a very low score. So it's very interesting to see that geography actually has an intuitively some effect but actually statistically a zero effect on the, the safety status. And so we went through each of these particular issues and I'm going to give you a few examples in a moment looking at how important they were. And we give it, instead of just talking about them, let me show you some pictures. Um, one of the big bugbears that comes out in insurance and in, in um, looking at these facilities in terms of their sustainability is how to pay for the treatments. And we have, Yatlik spoke earlier about the, the ergonomics, how much it costs per treatment. We have a wide scale of what treatments cost. One of the cheaper areas to be treated for for a table six or a diving treatment table is South Africa. You cop, pop across to, to, um, to the Caribbean and you're paying around about ten times more for the same treatment the Caribbean that we pay in South Africa. And that's driven primarily initially by what they call utilization. So they say that a lot of these facilities in remote areas are treating less than five patients a year and yet you have to keep that facility up to speed in terms of safety, staff, medical supervision, maintenance and so on and therefore the cost per treatment should be higher. That's the cost aspect. So we looked at utilization and how does it impact on safety. And you can see a fairly significant picture here. So people, uh, facilities that have less than five treatments per year are statistically very significantly less safe than facilities that are typically treating more than 50 patients per year. Most of these facilities would be patients doing a lot of HBO and the occasional diver treatment, although I can think of three examples around the world where they have a lot of diving accidents treated. But your typical diving accident treatment regimen in a remote facility is going to be somewhere between 5 and 50 patients per year. And you can see it comes up pretty much in the middle. That's the risk um, assessment score over there. So the higher you go, the less safe one would expect that facility to be looking um, at the scale that we established. Okay, a couple of these to go through just to show you. And Gregory spoke about training in terms of certification. And in South Africa, our staff are relatively formally certified in terms of training. But have a look at the picture. This one over here is where we have formally certified that the training that is done on the staff is being formally certified, meaning it complies with international expectations, international regulations. And in English that means they're CHDs, in other words they're registered with the National Board in the States, or in Europe they're part of the EBAS system. So they get training that is not done in-house, but that is recognized on an international basis. And look where the score sits versus informal training which might be very effective because the physician that is training them really knows the facility. But unrelated to the training, look at where the, the, the score comes out, in other words the safety regimen. So just forget about the where the no training because there were very few examples, very few chambers have no training. That's where such a broad bandwidth over here. But significant how different the informal training is to the formal training. If there's any motivation for a hyperbaric industry to have formal training standards and to credit your, your staff, that picture over there tells you that from a safety point of view. Um, another one that comes up, another interesting one, and it's actually one that Jack and I use very much in the SUMA accreditation is medical supervision. So if you don't have a doctor, we don't want to accredit you. But look how it comes up in terms of safety. 
if we have a full-time doctor, somebody dedicated to the facility, we have a, obviously a, a more safe, relatively speaking, facility where we have a full-time doctor. When the doctor's on call, meaning the doctor, it doesn't mean that the doctor might own the facility and be working down the passage. I mean the doctor has nothing to do with that facility ownership and work somewhere else. And when they do a treatment, then the doctor's called in to come and actually supervise the treatment. And you can see that we're getting a trend away from from more safe to less safe as we remove the amount of medical supervision at the facility. We call it supervision, but you can almost talk about commitment. It gives you some indication of commitment of the practitioner to that facility. And then the other interesting one, we have lots of debate about a better, a better facility to treat somebody at would be one that could do a COMEX 30. So if you can go deeper, you can do more sophisticated treatments, the facility should be a better facility to go to, but you can see the trend, although it's not significant in terms of the data, is if we treat up to three ATAs, we have the, the more safe environment, and the deeper we go in terms of these facilities, on looking at the international trends, the less safe the facility becomes. Intuitively, one can understand the deeper you dive, the more gas you need, the more complicated the system, the more things that can go wrong, so it does make some degree of sense. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of associated factors, about nine of them that we looked at to see how they correlated in terms of safety. And now the challenge was to put all of that into what we call a linear regression model and see if we can come up with some predictive model that can tell us if we find a chamber that we haven't seen, what sort of questions should we ask that facility to be able to get an idea of what their safety status is, not looking at all at their safety issues. So we're not asking if they have a safety valve or if their windows are certified. We're going to ask them things like, what type of chamber do you have? How often is that chamber used? Do you have a full-time medical doctor? Things that people would answer with more truth than if you started to ask them, do you do safety drills and do you train your people correctly or do you have um, procedures for what you're doing? And the end result of this, we, we did the regression in several ways, put the factors in, took the factors out and played around to see where we could get the most accurate model, was the four questions that came out were, is it a monoplace or multi-place chamber? And the monoplace chamber was the baseline. Um, how many patients do you treat per year? Is your tra training formal or informally done? And is the facility open 24-7? or is it open just during office hours? So four very, fairly inert, non-provocative type questions, and from that we could get a 95% confidence that we knew more or less where that chamber's safety status actually ended up. That's the, the outcome of the final model. You start off with a, with a, um, a it's called it a constant here of 209, and as you go through each of those questions, you add on the additional factor, and as a, with answering those four questions you can get the final score and then you can compare that score to the rest of the chambers that we'd assessed and you could then decide when you're making that referral whether that chamber was going to be something that you perhaps would rather spend an extra fifty thousand dollars and evacuate the patient to the mainland in Australia than have them treated at that facility or if it's a very mild bend you're not that concerned about the facility having to be aborted because they don't have enough gas and you then refer to that facility. Okay the conclusions of the study Firstly, we, we already knew that the risk assessment guide in the process gave us very good information in terms of building relationships with chambers and having some impact on those facilities improving their safety status. But after the study, we could see the information is obviously far more useful. But most importantly for me, it validated that the risk assessment guide that we'd established and had been using for about 15 years actually works. The information is consistent, it gives us good data, and we can actually use that data. Clearly we had a, a very simple linear model so we can actually predict the outcome of the safety status of facilities that we haven't assessed, we haven't had time to get to, or where the facilities don't want us to come and stick our noses in. So if you get in some of the islands they don't want you to come and look, just send us your guide and we're going to charge you $2,500 an hour because some of them charge up to $2,500 per hour of treatment in these remote areas. So clearly you have a, a medical legal um, decision to make do I refer there and can I actually afford for the patient to be treated at that particular facility. We now know which are the important safety concerns, not the ones that are trotted out by the ex-commercial divers or the guys that think they know everything about the business, but which are the safety issues should we be focusing on that have the most impact on safety. And then just really validating that it is the human interface, it is the people that run the chamber that decide on the safety status, not the equipment. The equipment plays a much lower ro a role in the overall safe, uh, safety status. And then just lastly, we always say those that 
that uh, fail to plan, plan to fail. It works in business and it certainly works in the safety of a hyperbaric faci uh, facility. If you don't plan for the accidents, then for sure you're going to have a big issue one day when you do have an incident. If you do plan for the accident and you train your staff correctly, your chances of mitigating and getting a much better outcome as a result of a fire or equipment failure is obviously much better. We've still got a bit of work that we can do and a couple of recommendations from the study that we could go back and look, re-look at the risk scores, the risk assessment scores, because they are a relative scale, they're comparing data within a relative range, looking at chambers compared to, to themselves, and perhaps there are some other industrial techniques and industrial models we can use to get a more absolute idea of where these risks sit. Possibly it's something that we could look at doing. And then perhaps there are other associated factors that we can look at, questions we can ask about our chamber that will help us to get an even more accurate final prediction of our predictive model. So those are areas that we can still study and have a look at. And in terms of the, of the top safety issues, there's obviously lots of scope here for us to go and actually study these and research them in further detail. Primarily the purpose of me actually doing the additional work is to give the physician the tools they need so that when they manage the facility, when you manage the facility, you are better informed A, as to what the issue is, but not just that you have an issue, B, how do you deal with the issue in a practical, realistic and reasonable way. So it's to give the tools back to the physician that they can focus, you can focus your attention on where you should be putting attention and stop worrying about things that people might come up with in an accreditation survey, and I don't mean South African terms, and I don't really want to pick on anybody, but it, typically when people put together accreditation surveys and they're looking at a, at a tick box system, they will pay lots of attention on things that might be completely irrelevant and then skip the things that are really relevant in terms of safety. So that would be the intention of going through and further researching the most important safety concerns that we have at these facilities. And that, that was pretty much it. So I think we did, a, we did a good job. We came out with data that was very meaningful to us. Um, lots of work that we can take going forward, but certainly for me personally, validated that the last 13 years of work that I've done, as Franz said, traveling out to these facilities, very often walking in there and seeing the looks of the staff being very apprehensive about how I'm going to actually approach it. But usually by the time I leave the facility, they were almost eating out of your hand. They wanted to suck the information from you because they felt empowered that they now actually understood what these issues are all about. So, any questions? Well, first of all, again, thank you very much for this presentation. I think one of the most remarkable things, other than the information, is your inappropriate use of the word we. Because most of this was you, you, and you. So, I know there were a lot of people involved, and you immediately respond by deferring. But I want to thank you personally for the mammoth effort that you put into this. And I think you really deserve a round of applause.